Hi, Shaquille. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Um, I guess a good place to start would be just um, if you could sort of just talk a little bit about yourself and, um, and some of the futures work that you do before we get into anything. Sure. So, um, Shaquille Ahmed, I usually introduce myself as an educator a futurist and a storyteller based in um, Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I have my own entity called Ridiculous Futures, through which I help governments, organizations, individuals to think about the future. And at the same time, also the country lead for EdTech Hub, uh, which is a global research network uh, that generates evidence of what works and what doesn't work when it comes to the use of technology and education. So those are some of the things that I do, aside from the other things I've told you yet. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess, in a f in a few lines, it would be great to hear what um, working as a futurist is, because I I imagine that term is not so familiar to so many. Yeah, yeah, or or maybe different people might have different uh, ways to think about it, right? And I think, uh, of course, on one hand, we talk about a historian who studies history, right, or studies the past, and a, and a futurist in a sense studies the future, but the future has not happened yet. So what we study is ideas about the future, or images of the future, or narratives uh, about the future of how people can uh, plan or work towards the future, uh, essentially. And I think uh, I, I got exposed to the term explicitly back in 2012 when I think I was working as an education researcher at the Brack Institute of Education Development. And, uh, and a futurist um, came and uh, he did a workshop on uh, the futures at Brack University, uh, essentially. And I think um, uh, and, uh, his way of being a futurist was essentially facilitating conversations around the future, right? And I think um, and it really resonated. Um, I, I think what really resonated was how futurists um, can help people uh, help people get feel more agency and influence towards the future. So I think that's how uh, I got into into it myself and started also self identifying as a futurist. Too. Yeah. yeah, and I guess that leads um, you know really well into the the kind of um, like first question that I had for you, which is. Um, how do you integrate storytelling into that work, um, into your work as a futurist? Um, whether you know either that's a, as a way to understand the future, or or you know imagining alternative narratives that can help with social change, or, or perhaps both of them. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, see, I think ever since I was young, I think all of us in some way are exposed to stories of different types. But I think I really appreciated like certain stories, like for example. Indiana Jones or Back to the Future um, and um, things that are growing up, right? Um, and I think I was I was I would also play around with theater when I was in school, but I didn't have like explicit agency or, or purpose of why I was doing storytelling right back then. And I think uh, and I think sometimes people will talk about doing stories for the sake of stories, right? And and I think <coughs> when I got exposed to futures thinking and future studies, especially in that workshop I just mentioned. In 2012, there's a particular framework um, called uh, causal layered analysis, which kind of explained how that a lot of the realities that we see around us are kind of shaped by systems and laws and policies um, that kind of dictate um, how how things uh, essentially form the reality, right? And a lot of the times, we try to come up with new laws and policies, um, but um, in the end, they don't get implemented, right? Even though they're well intentioned. Um, and I think um, what the reason why they say that they don't get implemented is because uh, people's mindsets, worldviews, or philosophies, or belief systems have not shifted. And I think our mindsets and worldviews and beliefs are kind of shifted, are kind of shaped by narratives and stories and myths and metaphors. And uh, and, and and there was a call that uh, there's an understanding that in order to shift worldviews and systems, you have to like basically introduce or get exposed to alternative myths and metaphors and narratives. And I think. And over there, I think I felt I felt like a rejuvenated sense of like how storytelling was so crucial towards the foundation of change, right? And I think, um, and 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 of course, uh, it's not like um, uh, I mean storytellers have a role. I mean, but at the same time, I mean you need to work with everyone in the, in uh, in the whole tapestry of change, right? Whether it's policymakers or like philosophers or uh, uh, and and storytellers. And I think. Um, a lot of the times, I think sometimes we, we will see that in a world where some of the arts and humanities are kind of like sidelined, right, or or felt that they're less important. But usually, but usually, like I think um, the reason why the sideline because sometimes uh, I think they are. Um, uh, I think people who come up with alternative myths and metaphors are kind of like troublesome to the powers that be, right, or, or to the status quo. 
and I think um, uh, it kind of felt like, yeah, uh, that's, I mean, storytellers are indeed powerful, even though, um, yeah, and I think that's how um, I got myself back into looking at the role of storytelling and, and, and change. Yeah. Mm. And um, are there any examples that you could share to kind of see that tangibly, like what a story can do in terms of creating a new idea, a new a new reality, a new a new future, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. So of course, I can. Uh, first of all, I can mention some things that I've played around with, and I think, and then I can talk, talk about one narrative in which I've seen change myself. So the, obviously, I played around with storytelling when it comes to spoken word poetry or when it comes to theater or, or even film or um, um, but, I, but at the same time I think even even very recently I've been also involved with um, writing story I'm basically writing uh, our I worked on one of the textbooks for a national curriculum called uh, in Bangladesh it's called Jibon Jibika Life and Livelihood so even there even putting in future in stories on the, the features uh, uh, on like a, a life of a girl in the year 2062 uh, in Dhaka growing up, right? And I think, um, but but then if I if I kind of like rewind back uh, and and talk about like where did I see some change? So I think there was one particular workshop, uh, a series of workshops that I did with with A2I when A2I was part of the Prime Minister's Office on the futures of education in Bangladesh in 2041, and that was probably in yeah like 2017 2018. And then we came up with a publication uh, that was kind of launched in, in 2019 uh, to the Ministry of Education. And we found that the Ministry of Education, like quoting statements and kind of like uh, uh, text from the book itself, right? So, for example, even this one myth, this one myth that, and, and of course, previously, I think this myth, even if not one in the World Bank, also came up with a report around the same time that, that um, schooling without learning is a great injustice, right? And... Um, and I think that's something that uh, even the minister also resonated with, right? Like, uh, like it's not enough to send children to school. You have to, like, children should be learning in school, right? And I think, um, but, and at the same time, there were other, uh, there are other, other small things, but, but we found that, like, like, some of the visuals and stories that we created back then uh, entered into minister's speech. And then, of course, from the ministers, you see the media picking it up. But then we also found that there was greater trust on some of the entities that were involved with that work to the extent that I think fast forward COVID-19, uh, we also developed a network called Next Gen Edu, where we also involved um, different government counterparts. And we were essentially working on our draft National Blended Education Master Plan uh, as well. At the same time, uh, this national curriculum reform was happening. So, so I think what I'm trying to say is that like, even though I think there are some storytelling images that were done like a few years back, you could see that some of these stories about how we envisioned uh, the future of education back then were actually resulting in actual policy change and actual implementation and actual mainstream scaling of, of initiatives. And of course, it's difficult to say that this is the exact logical sequence in which things happen. I'm sure a lot of factors played together to lead to that, but I think there is definitely uh, some momentum that was generated through, uh, through basically uh, us coming together, um, different... Um, people from different walks of life in the education ecosystem uh, to come together and, and envision uh, different stories about the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm interested to, t to take it a little broader um, since you mentioned, um, you know, writing a story about a girl who's living in, in Taka in, in Bangladesh mm. in, I think you said 2052 um, or 62. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to hear how, how you feel about the future um, how do yeah. you feel about it in general? Because a lot of people don't feel so great about it. And what kind of stories, perhaps, do you feel like um, you know that need to that need to be implanted to to change that or it's similar? I mean, there's a critical pedagogue. Uh, I think he lives in New York. Who, his name is Henri Giroux, who who said this line is impossible to be radical without being optimistic, right? And I think, and I think as a as a futurist, we don't try to pretend to be Nostradamus, that, saying that this is going to be the future, right, um, or, and predict. But I think the idea is that um, what can be these alternative futures, and of course we, we can have preferred futures, right, we can have futures that we, we would like to get towards too. And of course I think, I think when I say that um, what, what the future is going to be like, I'd rather talk about like, the future that I, I want to get to, right, and I think, and I think um, yeah, a future that uh, I guess um, 
I mean, I talk about the future of pe where people are are genuinely inspired, right? Um, not just by the work they do, just, not just by the lives they lead themselves, but by the people, the lives around them. As well, because I feel that I think um, we do live in a world where, um, yeah, we do f find that, like, I mean, people not generally, generally always enjoying the lives that they lead, right? And I think, um, and, uh, and, um, and, and I think, uh, it's quite a it's quite a broad point uh, when I uh, when I talk about this, but I feel like all of that kind of kind of can cover each and everything. Whether we talk about like climate change or whether we talk about like um, safety or or quality learning, because all of these are people's dreams and aspirations, right? And I think and I think in order to get towards that, I think we all be we all need to play a part uh, in working in in wor working towards that. And I think. <clears throat> yeah, and I think I, I recently, like, even before the call, I was mentioning this book called Stolen Focus, right? Uh, and and I think um and, and and I think one one thing that I take away I took away from that book is that the fact that we live in a very distracted world, right? And I think with a lot of like social media or like um or just basically digitally distracted uh, a lot, and I think and we're not just individually distracted, we're and we sometimes we can get distracted as a collective, and uh, and when you're distracted as a collective, it helps you. It prevents you from addressing um, complex challenges such as whether it's quality education or climate change uh, and, and all that. So, so I do feel that uh, like I'd rather work towards the future where people are being able to like focus on the things that they love and and, and the future that they want to work towards. So, so um, yeah, um, I, I do talk about like the future of education being screenless uh, as well, right? Because I feel like um, obviously a lot of Screen time is increasingly becoming a part of our lives, uh, and even <laughs> right now in this call, right? But, but, um, but, the, but the point being is that I'm sure we'll figure out, uh, and, and hopefully we'll innovate ways in which, uh, I mean, we can still communicate with each other from afar, um, but it doesn't always have to be like us sitting down in, uh, in, in one place. And we do see instances of that in science fiction and in and, and different ways in which uh, oh, we can... Um, uh, uh, we can do that. So yeah. So that's a. I mean, I could go on, go on more. I think I, I did write a book. Uh, I did write another story on um, the future of DACA in twenty fifty as well. Um, where um, I mean, right now, as we speak, I'm, I'm going through a bit of asthma and and coughing because it's, it's the winter in DACA, and then it's better. And so air quality will obviously, hopefully, <laughs> be different, and and we can breathe. Uh, we can walk around freely, freely in the streets and. Uh, and I do talk about like boys and girls playing uh, in fields uh, uh, more openly. So yeah, I think um, um, like irrespective of whichever topic uh, of development uh, we choose, I think there's definitely an aspirational future there. So so we hope that yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a it's a it's a positive way to think about it. Um, yeah. Would you have any? Any tips, you know, uh, for people who are, you know, embarking on storytelling, um, in order to, to, like, any tips for them to to write stories that, you know, uh, have a better chance of being effective in terms of making change um, or connecting to people and helping them to imagine a different future. Yeah, I mean, I think on one hand, of course, when we talk when we write stories about the external world, I think it's also an introspective journey as well, right? And I think, I think as storytellers, it's important that we also, uh, I think, understand ourselves uh, as well, understand our own assumptions, biases, how even our own stories, too, in this whole, of how we fit into this whole. So I think, um, I, I think definitely having that conversation with yourself is definitely uh, uh, useful and important because I think that also helps you to think about what kind of stories you might want to bring out or unleash into the world, uh, uh, into the world as well, and um, and and yeah, I mean, I think uh, I mean, there's no exact formula that it, that this exact story will will work. I mean, of course, there might be some good storytelling principles in general, right? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, th but um, but but aside from those storytelling structures, um, <coughs> yeah, I think. Um, uh, I think, I mean, one, 
uh, I mean, I think, I mean, several prompts that we definitely use, like like what story needs to exist that doesn't exist right now, right, that you need to bring out into the world to, uh, to make a difference. Or, or even like what stories you think already exist out there but are not being, uh, not being told enough uh, and whatnot. Yeah, I think the, um, the point that you've made of, um, of making sure you understand what your own story is mm. before you try and, you know, support somebody else to tell their story is a really important one because taking, you know, taking time for that um, yeah. introspection before mm -hmm. so that you know your biases when you're going to write something because they'll shape whatever mm -hmm. you're going to write, right? And also I think another thing is that, I mean, of course, um, storytellers can come in different forms. So it doesn't always have to be like you're a novelist and all that, right? I mean, I think a TikTok dancer is definitely a storyteller, right? And uh, but also at the same time, but even if you're a policymaker, right? And uh, and uh, and you're writing policy. Policy is story at the end of the day, right? It's a story that's going to last for a while, right? So I think so. The statement that you put out there is going to make a difference, right? And I think uh, um, so. So even then, um, uh, because policy not implemented is just narrative, right? And I think um, um, so. Um, so yeah, so I'm saying that even if something seems like a dreary document, it still is, is a story that you're putting uh, putting out there. And I think um, so, irrespective of which profession you work in, like, and then, of course, even in, in our oral conversations uh, with with each other, I mean, we we're, we're also definitely uh, exchanging stories. So, so in a way, I think we all we don't probably not identify ourselves all as storytellers, but we all definitely partake in the action of storytelling uh, in some way. Uh, or, or, or the other, and I think one thing is to kind of reflect, of course, that on what on what kind of stories am I encouraging that are potentially um, not leading to the world that you want to see, and and which stories are actually helping you get to the world that that you want to see. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's an, it's nice to reflect on yeah what what kind of future you want and how you're creating that, but also um, could you be helping to create a future that that isn't great as well, reflecting on that negative side as well. The, mm -hmm. um, and the thought of everybody being a storyteller is a great one, particularly in terms of policy. I can't say that I generally feel like politicians invest too much in storytelling, but absolutely, I mean, and they're, they're stories that affect millions and, you know, potentially mm -hmm. billions of people. So those are really important stories to tell. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I found myself sometimes <coughs> draft, drafting I was I was part of drafting the uh, the, blend, the blended education master plan, and then at the same time also like um, uh, and also like uh, something help help the minister with her with her speeches uh, as well, and and then of course, uh, I mean, even in those exercises, I mean of course the idea is not like I'm just making up whatever I want, but even, but even trying to like capture what people are saying, and there's a particular definitely a way that you can present it, and of course a lot of the times. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, in a way um, you're also an ed an editor as well as a storyteller because you edit the story that that comes out uh, yeah, eventually. So so definitely um, uh, there's something there to ref reflect on. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially when you were talking about yeah, reflect on your own story. I guess that's the link between it, right? Because your own story is the lens in which you're going to edit whatever you hear. Um, yeah, whatever you hear from. No, I think they're. I mean, yeah, really um, interesting points. When you um, when you when you talk to people about investing in storytelling, um, and you and you know you're trying to you're trying to make a case for that it, that it's worth it and that it can create change. Um, are there? Do you use you know historical examples or you know, anything like that to talk about kind of changes that we've seen in history and how they've been linked back to story? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, definitely different examples uh, will, will definitely help. So, for example, I mean, of course, technology is much more easier to explain, right? I think, like, uh, technology, like, whether it's Star Trek or Leonardo da Vinci drawing the flying man, the flying person, or Star Trek having, like, m mobile phones or CD-ROMs in it, and that were all fiction when they were created, but eventually it became, it became that. Or, or whichever science fiction writer you can take, that was, it's easy, it usually starts with fiction, right? Like, I think, uh, and it doesn't always have to be technology, right? Like, for example, we talk about, when we talk about Sultana's Dream, or um, or even we talk about, like, our, uh, Robin Tagore writing about what the ideal school, school might look like, 
um, I, I guess they're all stories um, before they were formed. And, um, and uh, uh, so I think those are examples uh, definitely like of where, and of course, like even when it comes to like, um, I mean, like stories may have like intended consequences, but also un unintended consequences, right? And I think, um, so like you'll see that um, there might be myths and metaphors, depending on how you interpret it, like it might do good things or, 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 or disastrous things uh, as well, right? So for example, I'm sure like a, a lot of um, our religious texts come from uh, our stories essentially, right? And I think depending on how you interpret them, um, uh, which, um, yeah, um, well, but, but I think one thing that's come, that comes to our mind is that even the lens in which we interpret <coughs> probably comes from one story or the other, right? Because um, how did we get that lens in the first place, right? And I think, um, so that's something to, uh, uh, yeah, it's making me thinking uh, as I speak. But, um, um, but yeah, I think historical examples can probably show both how uh, go, uh, good and uh, good things happen, negative things happen. So even, I, I think one typical story they talk about is like um, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and Snow White, right, on how... On how they perpetuated uh, the myth of like um, that the prince will save the princess, right? And I think, um, and I think some people may argue uh, for it, but of course um, we know their arguments um, against against it, where the prince is not all, always saving the princess. And nowadays, of course, we have cartoons uh, like in Inside Out or Frozen or or, or Brave, right? Um, where like the protagonist doesn't have to be a prince, right? The prince is able to save. Um, uh, herself, or uh, and or or save the prince um, too, right? And I think um, uh, I think a lot of people, yeah. I mean, I think those stories do do kind of shape uh, how we are, and I think those kind of stories are also help shape the conversation as we grow up uh, as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and it's exciting to think. I, I feel like it <laughs> imbues a bit of sense of hope that. Um, girls are going to grow up with those stories, right? Compared to mm -hmm. having the relatively one-dimensional version of the prince saving you each time. Um, just on, um, on kind of fiction, I was just interested in asking, um, you know, when you're a kid, you have ex exposure to generally like a whole lot of fiction, right? Which imagines new futures completely, mm -hmm. you know, what might seem as fantastical, ridiculous, all of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet when we're older, um, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, generally the kind of, um, uh, you know, entertainment that we have is, is generally a bit more non-fiction or it's based on other people's mm -hmm. lives. It's not so fantastical anymore. Mm -hmm. um, just interested in, in hearing because they you note know, because yes. your organization is called Ridiculous Futures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you see that that's like a key thing for, for adults in, you know, in, in getting back to the ridiculous in thinking about fictional things and things that might seem impossible? Yeah. I mean, I think one reason why it's called Ridiculous Futures is because Jim Dater, a uh, futurist, has a statement called that, um, he says that any useful statement about the future should at first appear to be ridiculous, right? Um, because if you're saying something that makes sense, then pro most likely you're talking about the present, right? And I think... Uh, a lot of the things um, can be ridiculous when we talk about when we talk about the future. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that I'm, I mean, now as I'm, I'm, I'm thinking aloud, that, that even nonfiction is also a form of fiction, <laughs> right? I mean, right? Um, because I think that, and I think that's sometimes yeah. an assumption that we like. Like the news is definitely fiction, right? Because it's um, it's interpretation, uh, it's a story of <laughs> what is that. And of course, sometimes it's clear fiction, and sometimes you can, uh, even though it it it. it pretends to be factual, but I think any thing that, pre even if it pretends to be factual, will still be an interpretation, uh, a certain way mm -hmm. of capturing it and, and presenting it to an, to, an to an audience, right? And I think, um, and I think uh, it was probably Alan de Botton who talks about, uh, I think who wrote something on, on, on the news as, like we grew up, uh, like not, not all of us, but those of us who go through school and, and university and, and whatnot, um, that we think that's education, but then after that, <laughs> the news becomes the main school teacher, right? Um, and because every day it shapes a reality of of how we see the world, and uh, and and definitely there are definitely uh, statements um, and biases uh, that are put in there that are not uh, that are not questioned or put under scrutiny as much as maybe a textbook is put up <laughs> under scrutiny, right? Um, like uh, we, I think, 
like right now, if we do find like um, the national textbook right um, being scrutinized, I don't know whether you're following the news and 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 all that. But at the same time, um, yeah, I don't think the news, uh, even though it comes out every day, it, I don't think it's as scrutinized as uh, as much. But yeah, um, but that's but but the reason is that yeah. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we're all we're always exposed to fictions. Uh, that's one thing, and of course, like, is there a need for uh, the imagination to be further nurtured within adults as well. Like uh, yes, but I think by by all means, right? And I think uh, I think uh, obviously stories are not just for kids and young people; it's for all of us, right? And I think um, and I think uh, uh, I think a friend of mine uh, he says that like dream, dreaming is not done in bullet bullet points, right, or in PowerPoint slides, right? Because we dream in images and and <laughs> unless you're unless you're making PowerPoint slides all day, then you end up dreaming about them. <laughs> <laughs> context but um but essentially uh yeah we we dream in those um images and uh and all that so yeah i think definitely um uh, it's important for adults and i think people are trying in different ways whether it's through it's through movies or film or or, or drama or whatever ways in which adults engage also um even if it's posters on the street or propaganda or slogans uh, those are also ways to engage ad adults too Absolutely. I wonder if one of the things that I'm sort of drawing from this um, conversation a bit is um, that, you know, we kind of be brave when you're telling stories, like be brave in the sort of um, the sort of alternative realities that you might spark in somebody. Right. Because, you know, it's possible. But like you say, if, if you're if when you're writing a story, you're just kind of um, you're you're just sticking to the status quo or whatever, like be brave in what it might yeah, what it what it might create doesn't mean, of course, like make everything up if it's supposed to be non-fiction or a biography or something. But you know, be brave in kind of imagining the impact that you could make as a storyteller, um, no, be, no. because it can be huge. And I think, uh, and I think, even our notions of bravery is also changing. Right? Again, stories are helping us change how we view bravery too. Right? And I think, I think we talk about nowadays that to be brave is to be vulnerable. Right? And I think, as a storyteller, um, yeah, I think. Practicing vulnerability is definitely uh, one way of uh, exercising bravery. Like, because you have to put yourself out there and and put yourself um, to scrutiny from whoever the, the reader and and want, but to be open to that um, exercise. And of course, but but I'm also I'm also cautious uh, of certain things, right? Like, I think I think there was um, a conversation. Uh, I think there was one story about Galileo, right? Uh, when he, when he went to the church, um, he was under trial, and I think. Uh, I think basically he told the church that uh, the sun, the earth is at the center of the solar system. And then his students were like, what? Like, why? But then he, he, he got free, right? And then Galileo said, like, I might as well do my work instead of trying to convince the church that I know that the sun is the center of the solar system, right? And I think, um, so so sometimes I do know that sometimes um, in certain situations, like some storytellers have to be careful in which, in which they tell their stories, right? And I think... Um, and uh, and I think so. It's not it's not for one to judge about why they didn't say it that way or do it that way, right? Some people just use Animal Farm or or nineteen eighty four to talk about uh, to use uh, uh, different. Or Sultana Sultana said that she had a, she had a dream, right? Or we're going to talk about a dream instead of saying that oh, this is how I want the world to be, right? And I think uh, and maybe that's those are interesting ways in which you can tilt on the story that you want to tell, but you use uh, metaphor or or images and. Uh, and other and other ways to, to still make your point, um, but but also like yeah, I mean I think like again again like it depends on people's perspective. Like are you are you going to use the stories to further create further divisions among society, or how do you bring people together, especially the person you probably hate the most, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so yeah, that's another thing to think about too. No, I, I like the, um, and it makes me think of what you were saying that even, you know, somebody dancing on TikTok is telling a story, right? So it's also exciting to think of the, um, yeah, the category of storyteller as being everybody in a whole, in, in every single way. And, um, you know, without putting too much scrutiny on that, it, you know, everything that you, um, even like doing a dance could inspire somebody. It could also perhaps create a division mm -hmm. in something. So it all has, yeah, you know, yeah. impacts which you probably won't see as well. Yeah, but I do think about, of course, that, I mean, does it mean that you tell, say any story that you want, right? Because I think, obviously, there are myths and metaphors that do con conflict with each other, right? So, for example, the myth of, like, 
boys are better than girls or, or, or men are better than women will we'll obviously inform the patriarchal mindset and whatnot. And, and, and there are definitely stories that do that, right? And as opposed to like, um, like men and women are equal or, or, or men and women are different but each have their own rights or like all humans are different and each have their own rights. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, of course, you might have this whole multiverse of different stories that are being told, but at the end of the day, like, I mean, I think there are forces behind why certain stories become dominant and certain stories are are left, you know, not not in the mainstream. And and I think, I guess that's the point of <coughs> of active activism or, or advocacy or, um, I mean, to bring out the stories that don't that have that should be in the mainstream to create a world that uh, is not the world that we want right now, right? And I think, um, so yeah, I mean, different people have different strategies in which they do it. I don't think, I don't think anyone for for want to say that your strategy is the wrong strategy, um, but to, I guess, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't have all the answers, of course, of how, how you know work towards that. But I think, my, I guess, my main my main point. Is that I mean, not all stories <coughs> will help you get there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the um, and it's good to put that it's good to put that lens on there as well, right? That it can um, mm-hmm. yeah, it can definitely do yeah, I mean, as much damage as it can do good. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a uh, another guy called Fred Pollack wrote an image of the future that that the the image of the the image of a society should be like flourishing and positive and blooming so that the society keeps flourishing but if it becomes negative then the uh, civilization will eventually diminish and decay right um but mm. having said that i think recently i was in a uh, like at the lit fest i was in a conversation where we talked about like i think someone i mean there's a panel they were talking about the importance of dystopias right and how um <coughs> i mean he's trying to he's trying to make the claim that we're living in a dystopia right now but of course there are different ways in, in which you can see that because if you read, I guess, um, even I, I mean, when I picked up Abed Bai's book recently, recently, like, um, like the fact that Bangladesh was the second poorest country in the world um, when it was um, right after 71 and how things have changed. But again, people argue that like being out of war is not a dystopia because that's, you're just forced to be in that position. But a dystopia is when like you have all these structures in place that have created this dystopia. Anyways, but I guess the conversation that we were having that I wasn't completely also clear in my head is that, like, like can dystopias actually help, help us work towards the future uh, the, or writing about dystopian futures? Can it help us? Or do we need, uh, do we need utopian <coughs> stories? And whatnot? Even though a lot of filmmakers and artists say that utopian stories don't sell, right? Positive stories don't just sell. Like, like ne- negative stories are what people like to click on or uh, and, and engage with. But then, <coughs> even if that's the case, I guess we still have a responsibility of figuring out how do we engage people um, uh, within that. And I, think, and I think sometimes what I'm also, I kind of like also think about is that, that it's not just about a utopia, dystopia, but, how, but even the story of how do we get there, right? Towards, the, even if you're living in a dystopia, like how are we getting out of it or how are we working towards the future that we want? I think those stories are also kind of uh, cool and interesting to explore around. And even if the story doesn't yeah. finish out there, but I think all those processes are also useful too. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting topic, you know, the, the utopia dystopia one, isn't it? Because, you know, you also have, um, you know, I, I, I personally, I tend to not really um, be interested in dystopias because I always think you need utopias so that we have a we have something to aim for, right? And we don't have many of them. We have a lot of dystopian narratives, um, but then it's interesting also, you know, to look at um, sort of you know a text like you know *Handmaiden's Tale*, right? Which mm. which people can also use, you know, that's you know dystopia, and people can use that to say this to to be really clear on this is what we don't want to have. So. Yeah. You know, I guess they can play roles in that as well, not just creating futures, but signaling and signposting. This is what we absolutely don't want. And maybe it's about exposure. Like, how much, how much dystopia do you constantly surround yourself with? And and how much, and maybe having a healthy balance where there's a, maybe my personal preference is that, like maybe 70, 30 percent as a mix. I mean, because I think, and I think even emotion. I think was it the Greater Good Science Center who talks about that happiness is not just about 
being happy all the time, but also having a range of emotions, right? And being able to embrace those emotions. But then you have mostly positive emotions, but you also have ne uh, some negative emotions too, right? And I think, uh, um, so that's also, I guess, maybe when it comes to like, maybe our s storytelling diet as well. <laughs> Or sorry. Yeah, that, it's a good point to think of, right? That you need both. Otherwise, you know, it's also like difficult to appreciate the good if you don't have the bad and, and vice versa. Yeah. It's difficult, though, in yeah. that, I mean, you know, you touched on a kind of, um, on a, I guess, like what seemed, it's a, it's a, I don't know, controversial-ish sort of statement in that good stories don't sell, right? Um, mm. You know, whether they don't sell or, you know, interestingly, I often... Um, my personal view when I've seen dystopian and utopian kind of narratives is often that the dystopian ones are really well done, like very well detailed and like you know, really, um, yeah, really like nuanced and that sort of thing. Whereas the utopian ones, sometimes not so much. So I guess, you know, maybe it can also come down to at the end of the day, the, the, you know, the quality of the storytelling, maybe... You know, if we're telling really, really good utopian stories, then or maybe they need a bit of dystopia in them as well to make them sell. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm thinking about like even like when it comes to comedies. I mean, there's some sort of conflict definitely, but then of course, I mean, you can generally have positive um, movies as well, right? Um, and and all that. And I know that even when it comes to like certain movies, like even whether it's Avatar: The Last Airbender or or even if it's like um, Avatar, like James Cameron and, and, and all that, like, I mean, obviously both creating worlds that I think people want to live in and exist in and, uh, uh, and what are, are maybe forms of utopia um, uh, too, but, but yeah. But, but you see that even if, but even in those movies that their utopia is kind of like disturbed <laughs> by certain elements and um, yeah, yeah. That is, that is. Yeah, so maybe it's about having a little bit of that mix in everything, right? Being able to have a utopia, but with a little bit of dystopia in it. That's really, I mean, that's, um, yeah, been really, I think, helpful and, and insightful.